We'd like to start by acknowledging that Venture in the Capital is part of the Paul and Carol Hill Distinguished Entrepreneur Speaker Series. And thanks to the Hill's generosity, this event and other entrepreneurial programs are possible here at Georgetown. My name is Drew Peterson. I'm a junior at the McDonough School of Business and one of the student organizers of Venture in the Capital, Georgetown's first student-led conference exploring the intersection of venture capital, entrepreneurship, and public policy. I'll be moderating this discussion with Rick Heitzman. Rick Heitzman is a co-founder and partner at FirstMark, where he focuses on investments in consumer technology, marketplaces, healthcare, gaming, and data and information services. Rick has led investments in companies such as Pinterest, Riot Games, DraftKings, Airbnb, StubHub, Discord, and many more. Before founding FirstMark, Rick was an entrepreneur and founding member of the senior management team at First Advantage, where he helped grow and sell to First American. Rick has been named to the Forbes Midas list as one of the world's top venture capitalists for the last three years and has received similar distinctions as one of the world's top venture capitalists from many other publications. He also serves on the board of directors of the New York Venture Capital Association and holds a bachelor degree from Georgetown University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Rick, how are you? We appreciate you joining us this morning. Hey, thanks for having me, Drew. This is great. I love Georgetown and I'm happy to be here and support everything you're doing with venture in the capital. Uh, great to hear. Well, uh, to get started, out of college, you went directly into investment banking, working in M&A and distressed buyouts. You then founded and successfully exited First Advantage at over a billion dollar valuation before moving into venture capital. How did your time in banking and as an entrepreneur affect your journey as a venture capitalist? And do you think it was a necessary step in pursuing a successful career in venture? Well, I guess going backwards to forwards, I don't think there's any really necessary steps to getting into venture. There's so many different ways. People have been bankers. They've been journalists. Obviously, clearly, a lot of people who are founders of companies and make their way in that direction because they have a deep domain knowledge around a certain sector. But I think that, you know, everyone's path, you know, you're always looking for, you know, when you kind of a, a find something that you really enjoy, you're good at, and you want to make your passion, you don't know it during the time you're building up that resume or you're building up the credibility for the role you were meant to play. And I think, you know, from my path, you know, starting out in finance, and I was a finance major as well as international business at uh, Georgetown, that uh, I was able to say, you know, I have, I was able to build some skills around company management, I was able to build some skills around valuation, understanding financial statements. And that's something I think that's helpful. And even as an early stage venture capitalist, a lot of our companies exit to the public markets, and understanding business models, and understanding you know, how companies are valued and why they're valued as such really matters. On the other side, slightly differently, uh, and I ran uh, you know, finance for a public company at US Search, uh, and then at First Advantage, I ran mainly corporate development. Uh, but that was kind of the entrepreneur's journey of you know, being out there um, you know, post September 11th, and probably no one on the call remembers that, but it was very dark and even darker time for venture capital now, and obviously challenging for our country. But you know, it was really hard to raise capital and probably the most difficult fundraising environment I've seen in you know, kind of the 25 years I've been doing this. But it took me 87 meetings to raise $16 million to, in order to keep the company afloat. And you know, what you realize, and that was you know, a very different business kind of transforming what was phone and fax into a digital workflow around data information around people. But the empathy that you create by being able to having walked in an entrepreneur's shoes and be able to say, hey, I know if I don't raise this money, my company is going to be out of business. I know, you know, I have to go take a bunch of meetings. Some people don't even like us or, or know us, or I, I understand what it's like to, you know, fire people older than my father or do, or do a bunch of stuff, which uh, is awful hard for entrepreneurs, but having them know that you've done that in your past, you know, increases that credibility, increases the empathy for you. So, you know, what you try to build is individual skills and individual pillars that, you know, help you be better at your job, you know, when you're later in your career. Uh, and I'm sure that that's really helpful advice. And I'm sure uh, a lot of the students on this panel uh, take that to heart. Um, and you're, you're a fellow Hoya and you studied yes. at Georgetown, uh, you know, the shirt, the shirt uh, clearly displays it. Um, looking back on your time at the Hilltop, what was your favorite moment and how did your undergraduate education influence your career as both an entrepreneur and investor? So uh, I was I was there. I had a lot of favorite moments. My my probably my favorite part of Georgetown was the community that's built there, and the ability to do things with friends and whether they're 
um, academic or whether they're uh, for fun or whether they're something in the community. Uh, and I was very involved in GUSA when I was there. I was the GUSA president. I think the, you know, the, my general feeling is a general feeling of warmth and joy when you think about all those times that you spent together and uh, building relationships, which I still have to this day, you know, we're, we're all very excited. I'm, I'm amazingly approaching my 30th reunion uh, in a couple months. And the, the flutter of emails, texts, calls of everybody wanting, excited to be back really tells you what an incredibly special place Georgetown is. I couldn't agree more. Um, and then you, you and your co-founder, um, Amish Johnny, uh, launched First Mark in 2008 in the midst of a recession. Um, why did you start uh, decide to start the fund then? And how and why did you decide to become co-founders? So you, know, you, you, never, you never get a perfect time to pick to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, in, in first advantage, um, a lot of what we did was in the wake of the, uh, the tech bubble blowing up in, in 2000. And then uh, we, start, we started, for, you know, First Mark takes a long time to get started. So, you know, it, it took, we, we weren't thinking about the recession. We were just thinking about starting it. And coming out of my entrepreneurial experience at first advantage, what I saw was a real gap in the market. And just like you know, any other kind of product company, what you hope is, is your passion about a, a problem that you've identified, you could personally identify and have empathy with that customer, and you believe you could create a better decision. And uh, you know, that was kind of the path we went down. And at the time, there was a lot of venture capital firms, largely in Silicon Valley in Boston, uh, largely you know, very hierarchical. And what we said was, hey, we could be, have a very focused firm and we were going to focus on certain sectors. We we're going to focus on being the first investor and really being a true partner with entrepreneurs during their journey. And we we're going to focus on New York. And at the time, people thought New York was never going to be a venture capital uh, and that it was um, you know, dominated by finance or media or advertising. And you know, therefore, there was a room for startups because of these structural problems. And most people thought that was true. So you have to, when you're starting anything, take a, a contrarian view because you know, you're know you looking for uh, creases in the market. So our contrarian view was, hey, New York, because of all of these elements, all these industries, all these large customers was going to be a great place to do venture capital. You know, being early was going to be important because we could build deep relationships with those entrepreneurs. And then we're going to wrap it in a layer of service that we were going to build out a platform team that was going to help our companies. And maybe differently than some of the experiences we had, we were going to do what we said we we're going to do. And you know, whether it's venture capital or life, you know, you're sometimes amazed by the amount of people who don't do what they say they're going to do. And we were able to say, hey, that's deep in our ethos. And we were fortunate enough that even when no one knew who we were or our firm was, folks were able to bet on us and believe that that was true. And now, you know, almost 20 years later, it's all coming to pass. Um, well, to carry that on, uh, First Mark, uh, as we just discussed, was founded in 2008 and early on became one of the best performing sub $250 million funds on the street. And now you manage well over $2 billion and, and are still performing at a leading level. You know, what have been the biggest challenges of scaling to your current size? And how have you been able to find opportunities to invest and still allocate capital as effectively as uh, you did with your smaller funds? That's a great question. So you know, the, the key to scaling, and again, it's not specific to venture capital, it's probably any business, is people. And how do you get great people? And, you know, half of my conversations I had at, at First Mark when we were starting were yesterday, were about how do we get people in the door? And venture capital is different than being a widget factory in that you know your all your whole product is your elevator assets and the people that come up in your elevator every day. So it's a hundred percent the people. Um, so therefore, how do we both bring in the best people and performance manage them to having them be, do their best work? And that's always the challenge. And can you get enough people who are great at their job and performing well and aligned and happy? To be able to do that. And I think we got very fortunate in that, you know, that resonated not only with entrepreneurs, but it also resonated with people who wanted to be in venture capital. Uh, you know, we added my partner, Matt, we added my partner, Adam, over time. So we were able to build out functional areas and we we're able to build out people who we really wanted and were excited to be partners with and build out the firm and therefore, you know, ladder up in, in terms of fund size. Um, you know, we're also benefited tremendously 
by kind of the explosion of New York. So New York, um, again, was when we started, was the seventh biggest venture market in the world, growing pretty slowly. Today, it's you know arguably this. It's definitely the second, but you know depending on the quarter, will surpass San Francisco as the number one city for venture capital in the world, and it's still one of the fastest growing. So the amount of opportunities and the supply of, of potential companies to invest in has really increased. And you know, we're probably not even you know, scratching you know, at our fund size, uh, the demand side. So we think that there's a huge opportunity still, and we've actually you know, been oversubscribed and not taken as much capital as we could in the past, because we believe we're limited by the amount of great partners we, we could bring to the field. Um, well, to, to hone in on that focus on on, on people, uh, how have you been able to continuously hire top quality talent? Um, you know, what do you specifically look for while recruiting investors at First Mark? So I think there's probably two different places that are our kind of insertion point. We actually have three. We have investors, we have principals, and we have partners. Um, and obviously, there's a different degree of consideration at, at each level. Um, you know, I think probably the most pertinent for this crowd is the investor level. So these are folks who tend to be, you know, in their late late twenties. Uh, generally, have gone to a, a great school. Some not as great as Georgetown, but we still we still let them apply. And then uh, they they tend to have kind of a combination of at least two of these three things, where it's uh, startup experience, um, some kind of quantitative or structural experience, as well as um, you know some kind of investing experience. So I'll kind of I'll unpack that a little bit. On the quantitative side, you know, whether we talked a little bit before about being in investment banking, understanding financial statements, understanding valuation, understanding concepts like comps, you know, being in a, a, a strategy consulting firm and understanding competitive advantage, understanding business models and how businesses work, because it's really a framework of how we look at everything. The second thing would be, hey, work in startups, how do startups really work? So if you're going to be, um, you know, being in the room at startups, evaluating startups, if you don't really understand how they work, and the controlled chaos it is, even at the best startups, you know, it's really hard to understand it, have empathy, add value. Uh, and, you know, we've oftentimes see, you know, needles on the chalkboard type uh, type comments from people who really don't understand how that works. And it's awful hard for them to progress in the organization. And the third thing, which we don't get as much of, and we, we don't require as much as investing experience. So if people have invested, especially the, the type of investing we do, it's really important. Um, and then, you know, fortunately, we have a tremendous, we, we want to grow and build people. So those investors sometimes progress to the principal level. The principal level is, you know, you're doing more of those things. You've built some and more of those skills. You're probably three to five years after being an investor, either at first mark or somewhere else. And you've been able to think about, um, you know, a process. We hired a great guy. Derek Chu last year at the principal level, he had uh, he had been at Credit Suisse as a banker and an investor. He had been uh, at, at Menlo Ventures as a venture capitalist, and then he was at Airbnb in corporate development as chief of staff. So he was able to see that ride in a company we knew really well. And because of that Airbnb experience, he had tremendous experience in marketplaces. And, one of, it's, and we were probably one of the bigger marketplace investors in the world, having done things like DraftKings and Airbnb and Pinterest and even StubHub historically, that we like that area. We think he had tremendous operating experience in that area, and therefore he could come um, and help build it out. And we've done, you know, invested in companies like Pickle, which is doing great, and Metal Loop, which is kind of building out that practice area. And our hope would be those can, he continues to do well, those companies continue to do well, and he could progress on to being a partner at, at First Mark. Um, well, to, to hone in on that that marketplace side, um, you famously invested in Pinterest in 2009, and it's $600,000 angel round. Um, and Pinterest is now public and was worth over $50 billion at its peak. Yes. Uh, what led you to initially invest in the company, and how did you help support the company and its founder as it scaled? So yeah, it was it was great. Um, feel very fortunate. I think Ben Silverman is one of the great entrepreneurs as he as he managed through that over probably you know a dozen years where he was the the CEO and and we were very close. Um, so you know, we we actually met him. You know, we talk about you know how do you how do you get in front of uh, venture capitalists at the NYU business plan contest and it was two people and an idea and it was the idea 
which took hold with us. And what we like to see is people who have contrarian ideas and people who are thinking about the world differently, usually along multiple scopes. So um, at, at the time, it was before even iPhone 1. And Ben was, uh, I think, and then as we were talking, I think iPhone 1 came out and Ben was able to articulate, hey, what, you know what's going to happen in the world? The world is going to move to a place where almost all your content is consumed on, on, on your phone. And because of that, and you're limited in terms of screen space, you know, it's going to be, you're going to move to a more visual world. And there's going to be so much content, that content is going to have to be curated through peers and professionals. And uh, as I, we agreed with all those things, we agreed in both social and algorithmic curation. We agreed that the mobile was going to be the next big platform. And we said, that's great. Well, what do you have? He's like, that's, that's all I have. I have that idea. Uh, and we said, great. And we, and we um, led the seed round, or I was probably in taste parlance, a pre-seed for Pinterest. And we were with that journey, you know, through being a public company, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably still a $40 billion public company um, from, you know, a couple million dollars valuation when we started. And it was, you know, a really fantastic experience for everybody involved in that. Uh, so that was, that's the, the key thing is, is, is you're coming in, especially at the er earlier stages, the more orthogonal you have to be, you know, are you doing something different and can you articulate, although I'm doing something different and maybe contrarian, I see these mega trends uh, at my back. And if you agree in those mega trends, you know, you'll come to a similar conclusion. And although you're probably doing multiple contrarian things and then compounding and therefore compounding risk, we also think you're compounding return because if multiple things are contrarian work, you have great upside. So whether that was Pinterest and those three things, Riot Games, and the, the world was moving to more online gaming, the world was moving to item-based economies within, uh, within games, and the world was becoming more social. Those were the kind of context. Uh, Shopify, where we did the Series A. Similarly, more people were buying things online. Software as a service was going to be the business model. And there was going to be a network of software that was going to have to be built into a core uh, core foundation and platform to grow out. Um, and you know those were all in in retrospect, you know they they seem obvious, but at the time, um, not non consensus views. Um, well, when I went public, what was the what was the feeling at first, Mark? <laughs> oh, it was euphoria. It was euphoria uh, that uh, you know, and it was it was less about the. I mean, it was, I guess it was somewhat about the economics, but also more about, hey, this thing that and every great company we've worked with has also had uh, at least one period of existential crisis. Uh, hey, this thing is this thing is going to go bankrupt. This, you know, whether it's you know something we didn't expect happening, whether it, whether it was a financing crisis, whether the product didn't work, um, you know, we thought, yeah, this could all this is all going to go away. And so you deal with those ups and downs and, and huge ups and huge downs with that founding team and you become very, very close. Um, and so, you know, to be able to cross the finish line together is one of the greatest feelings in the world. And, you know, we were there, you know, with Ben's parents and his sister and his brother-in-law and, and everybody where we're all sharing stories about that journey and, you know, hey, calling us late at night saying this thing's going to fail and whether it's me or Ben's mom or, or co-founders or people who've been there along the way. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing, it's a really an amazing thing to do something where it's completely contrarian. Uh, obviously, oftentimes people think you're going to fail, but being able to, through grit and a force of will, you know, get from here to there and really create an iconic company. Wow. Um, well, to, to stay on the portfolio front, uh, first mark is over a hundred uh, companies within this portfolio, and you currently or previously have sat on the board of many of them. How do you deal with your own time allocation across uh, your portfolio? And how do you prioritize your time to focus on companies and boards that need it most? I think that's that's the, uh, the age old question. I, I, again, something I still deal with, you know, 20 plus years in uh, every day. Uh, how do you how do you, you know, maintain your reputation and your brand promise? Well, at the same time, you know, putting your effort where you're, you're going to get the most return on that time. Uh, so, and that's important. And then also, how do you, how do you deal with the tension of new versus existing opportunities? So starting with that is, you know, we always, we always focus on, 
our existing portfolio first and you know make sure that our entrepreneurs have the best experience that we have the availability and um, from both the physical time and space as well as mental time and space to be a great partner to them and then how do you think more about you know as you grow you actually layer on board seats and how do you think about you know all those different people and you know there at times you have a bunch of different folks at once who you know just need five minutes of your time which is really an hour and there's you know 10 people who, who need that between now and the end of the day and there's only six hours in the day and you have kids and a spouse and everything else um so how do you how do you triage that is 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 key and no one's great at it i'm not, I'm not great at it I, and i work at it every day but I think the most important thing is you know, being transparent with them, saying, hey, I understand you need five minutes. Let's be honest, I actually think it's probably at least a half hour and probably an hour. Let's talk about what you need that for. And maybe I could, we could talk tomorrow. Maybe we could go for a walk. Maybe, maybe you know, we could talk after my kids go to bed and be, making sure you're empathetic because that's the most important thing for them. And you have to understand that as an investor or a mentor that this this is a crisis for them, although it might not be a crisis in your world, being able to be responsive to them and say, hey, I understand this is going on. I'm avail I, I could be available and help you on this, or I could be available via email or text to do those things. And then, you know, as a fiduciary to your LPs, making sure you're spending your time where you get the most bang for your buck. And, you know, the 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 opposite or maybe the the um, the yin to the yang of keeping that brand promise is often that venture capital is a, is a power law business, right? So, you know, a certain uh, a certain few percent of your companies create an outsized portion of your returns. So if you think about that, um, you should be having a power law of your time against that. And the ones that you could really make it both, you can make an impact. There's a large market, they, they're, they're producing, and you can do things which um, positively impact the company, which not all venture capitalists think through. And, you know, as you think through that, you know, that that's, you should be spending your time in that power law world. And that's the other, you know, maybe art rather than science uh, as we, as we all help to do, hope to do a better job managing ourselves. Well, perhaps that's what contributed to the sale of the the new fa the now famous Power Law VC book. Yes, <laughs> that everyone's it's a good reading. book. Great book. Uh, it's a great book. Um, uh, in in within that uh, uh, portfolio, uh, you know, one of your uh, models for your firm is uh, you are the company you keep. Uh, yep. Can you expand on what this model means to you, both professionally and personally, and how you uh, have changed the company you keep over the course of your career? Um, do you look for anything now that you didn't used to or vice versa? Uh, you know, I, I think so. You, I think yeah, they, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, you want to be with people who are high integrity, who are, who are curious, who are smart, who push you to be a better version of yourself. I mean, they, uh, we all know the things you are, the five people around you. So, you know, what does that mean if you look around and say, hey, am I going to be more like this person? in five years and you know whether that's healthy eating habits or, or how, how people spend their time all right you know hopefully you have a partner in life and you also have a friend group and family who's pushing you to be a better person so that's from a from a human and personal development perspective incredibly important from a firm and a professional perspective it's the same thing right you know are, are you spending time with people that are positive are you spending time with people that are curious are you spending time with people that are smart are you spending time with people who want to get better every day and so even as you know the nice thing which you kind of alluded to is you get probably better access to better people over time um and you know starting when i was at georgetown uh, I, I you know probably my best access was the guy i could order my sandwich from at wise miller's and he was the entrepreneur I knew, but then I was able to, you know, you have, you meet more people, you build deep relationships and that matters. So, you know, I think the key thing is, you know, as if you find someone who you believe like hey, this person's great, not because of their resume, but because the way you interact with them, because you can learn things from them, you know, how do you make sure that you keep them in your orbit? And, you know, I, as I mentor people, whether at Georgetown or outside of it, or even CEOs, um, you know, how do you make sure that you're, you have a good symbiotic relationship with them? And, you know, people reach out all the time and said, hey, can I have five minutes of your time, which often is not five minutes, it's often more. 
And uh, I was just talking to someone last night who's a Georgetown alum, might even be on the, on the webinar now. I won't call, shout her out because uh, you don't want to embarrass her, but yeah, I said, you know, hey, as you go into uh, interviews around BC or you, you ask for people's help as you continue your, your, your casework and your academic studies at Georgetown, you know, show, you know, come up with something that's both unique and value added for the people you're talking to. And, you know, and how do you have a different approach that someone says, hey, that's that's really interesting. You know, I talked to this guy, Drew. He's, you know, he's a young guy, but he seems really smart. And you know what he told me? This thing that was super interesting, which is also relevant to me. And I, I'm, I'm excited to, you know, talk to him again. And being able to have that, um, you know, people call it different things in different books, value nuggets, um, gold, gold drops, golden, golden eggs, that uh, is super important as you build out your network and enables you to ladder up and enables you to build a reputation um, and ar around yourself that as you, you know, and as you get more known, you know, your reputation precedes you, good or bad. So you want to make sure that people out there in the ecosystem, when they hear about Drew Peterson or Rick Heitzman, know that, oh, I know this guy and there's, you know, what you become half a degree from everybody else and people are saying the, the things that you want them, you're proud that they say about you. Really great advice. Um, thank you. Uh, and now switching more so to the current event side, you know, it seems that most inventure are hoping that in 2024, the private market will follow the, par the, the public markets rebound and ride the AI train out of a relatively dry and challenging 2023. For you, what are the key indicators that you're in a hype cycle and how do you avoid buying into set hype and staying true to what has continually allowed first mark to identify winners regardless of cycle. Okay. So I'm going to break that you know, kind of three questions I heard there. Where are we in the cycle? What does that mean? Are we and are we going to and then if we ride the AI train out of it, what does AI mean? And then how do you not get caught up in a, in a train which might be a bubble? So I think you know I think you probably were maybe more optimistic than I, than I am about hey this is interest rates are going to fall IPO markets are going to open. Everything's going to be fine. I think um, you know the markets rebound, right? I'm not. I haven't looked today, but you know we could hit all-time highs. And at the same time, you know some firms, mainly the Magnificent Seven of the top technology companies, have rebounded tremendously over the over the course of 23. Going into 24, it's actually going to be a little bit jagged, where some companies will overperform and some companies will underperform. You know what people have historically called a stock picker's market. And I think the same thing is going to be on the IPO side. I think it's still going to be a down year for IPOs. There'll be more than the last two years, which were two you know, historically bad years. But there's going to be companies that are performing and doing well, uh, driving real value for their customers and have great business models, which will kind of lead us out and begin that unfurling. So that's I think that there, there's, um, you know, there's a morning and you're starting to see the sun come up. But it's you know it's not coming that not coming as quickly as you know, I, me or you might hope or some people expect. I do think that you know people are also looking for what's that next great mega trend that people can you know that's going to capture private and public um, investors' imagination and therefore lead us out by you know getting on to some cycle of, of both hype and and results. And you know I think there's there's both of those things in AI. We see our AI, our AI portfolio driving real revenue growth, bit great business models in the public sector. Obviously, Nvidia has been kind of the the poster child of driving both results and market value over the course of twenty three. Uh, I think that's going to persist. I think some of those companies, like any other sector, are going to be great long term companies that have a real business and a real business model. Some of those companies uh, will be hype and will go away. And, you know, in every, any kind of Cambrian explosion you see in new sectors, that market shakes out similar to that. As we think about how do you separate the wheat from the chaff at first mark, and we, we've had, um, you know, deep AI practice for a, probably a dozen years, maybe more so. My partner, Matt Turk, is one of the leading uh, th uh, thinkers and, and market, um, market thought structures and, and his mad landscape around machine learning, artificial intel intelligence, and data. And he's been doing that. I think he's been doing that for 12 years. So I think we're further along um, than that than almost any venture firm. So we're super excited about how that world's changing. But you know, we look at it no differently than we look at software 20 years ago, where we look at a consumer product of 
Do you have, are you creating real value for your customer? Do your customers like you? Is there a return on what they're spending with you? If they're giving you their time, are they, are they getting back time? If you're a business, is there a, is there a cash ROI on that software purchase? And therefore you're proving you're creating value. And then does your business model enable you to capture some portion of the value you create? Uh, and that's the next piece that that's obviously super important. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of AI companies who do that. And there's going to be a lot, a lot of AI companies, some of which are pretty highly valued that don't. Like, I, I know you guys have touched on negative CAC in, in your blog. Yes. Uh, yeah, I know that. Yeah. So we, we're a big believer in that. And especially in a world where CAC got very, very high and it's, you know, cost customer acquisition, um, for those at home. And it's, um, you know, especially in a world where, and we could talk about, we talk about it in the enterprise channel. We also talk about it in the consumer channel probably easier, more um, easier to unpack on the consumer side that, you know, if you're acquiring customers, it's just gotten incredibly expensive. Um, there's been, given the amount of companies funded, a lot of people are comp competing for that same customer. And then sadly, they're competing for that same customer in the same channel. So the, the meta family of companies, you know, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or um, the Google family of companies of, of Google search and AdWords, as well as uh, YouTube, et cetera. So, you know, you have really two companies who are capturing a lot of the value of maybe an overfunding in a lot of the sectors. And so how do you how do you compete? Because you don't want to compete on price by who could pay more to Google to get customers, because that's a that's a loser's game. So how do you create businesses and business models where you have partnerships or ways that customers will opt in and therefore you're not racing to the bottom by chasing that next dollar of CAC? And that's been that's been a huge thesis of ours, um, you know, going into the time where, where money was very cheap in the zero interest rate environment. And, and, and we've kind of held that and that's persisted through. Uh, well, to hone in on another sector of, of your portfolio, you know, the healthcare market in, in specific has, has taken a hit since this 2021 boom. Um, and you recently said in a podcast interview that healthcare is the biggest part of our GDP. It's the fastest growing part of our GDP, and probably as a country, it is our lowest ROI of our GDP. As a firm, First Mark has bet heavily uh, in this sector with multiple investments, including Roman, Ezra, Legacy, Parsley, and many others. You know, how do you believe the healthcare system is broken, and how can startups fix it to operate successfully in this highly regulated industry? So I think that I think I I've said all those things. I, I still agree with all those things, which is good. Uh, that. You know, the software has been a lag or uh, healthcare has been a laggard in development in adopting technology. You know, there's structural reasons, um, partially because the government is probably the largest payer of healthcare. And then uh, there's been general consolidation in the payers, there's been consolidation in the providers. Uh, and, you know, there's been, it's been a hard ROI. So what we've seen is um, how do you have either new products or new delivery mechanisms, which create a lot of value that you can share with the end user who's the patient, the payer, and in a, in a world where in healthcare it's very different than oftentimes, you know, if you're buying, if you're buying a sweater on the internet, you're the payer and the customer. In healthcare, those two things are separate. So you actually have two customers, which makes it much more difficult. So um, we're looking for unique things, unique products, you know, in Ezra is a unique product in full body MRI scans for generally pre-cancer. Um, incredible value of being able to detect cancer three to five years earlier, saving people's lives, uh, and also and therefore tremendously valuable and a great customer experience. So that's something that never existed before that we're able to use artificial intelligence, to get a better sense of actually what's going on inside your body. And then Roman, which is a better uh, customer experience and being able to deliver largely um, the push that probably people have seen, whether it's in Union Station or, or on uh, college football games is Robotio, this new wave of super drugs of GLP-1s and being able to, to use that to combat obesity and, and diabetes. And that's been a generally, you know, for what we've seen so far, a wonder drug in terms of, you know, the health benefits and the ability to under, uh, have customers understand if they qualify for it and have access to that drug and then manage that access to the drug to be as most effective I, I think is going to be really great for consumers, the payers, and uh, hopefully also to a certain extent, Roman along the way. And then this market as a whole faces many barriers and many venture capitalists 
uh, avoid uh, the sector, historically avoided it because of bureaucracy, FDA approvals, and many other concerns. Well, entrepreneurs have also avoided it uh, due to just the many barriers of entry. You know, with these challenges in mind, what do you believe needs to change in order to foster more entrepreneurship in healthcare and health tech? So uh, we like we, we like something. We like regulatory barriers. You know, we were invo involved in DraftKings and Airbnb and StubHub that all faced you know regu uh, re regulatory question marks. And you know, if uh, if people are scared of a sector, it makes us want to dig in and not necessarily run to it, but understand why. And is that a good reason for folks to be scared or a bad reason? So um, that you know, complexity. Um, doesn't doesn't bother us. We actually like it because that gives us some kind of an opportunity to have um, a proprietary competitive advantage based on um, based on doing our work and based on maybe having a network which gives us better information. So we we like those elements of healthcare. Um, you know, certain elements of healthcare we don't like because we find them um, you know, maybe just too hard hard sales cycles, hard payer patient relationships. And we like we like things that work for everybody. So if you think about the patient, the payer, the provider, um, you know, are you creating enough value that there's value to share with everybody? And you know, we see things where like the, the patient likes it, the payer hates it. That creates a, a, a weird tension that could limit the upside. But you know, how do, how do those things all come together? Uh, and we think you know, digital health is going to be an important part of the future. Um, obviously, telemedicine has been a huge, uh, huge piece of the last five years, but that's going to continue and we continue to be excited about the sector. And another sector that's uh, definitely more controversial than uh, healthcare and health tech uh, is crypto. Um, and earlier this month, the SEC approved 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, and in the lead up to this, many public figures and many notable uh, uh, people changed their outlooks towards crypto and its validity as a security. Uh, you have relevant exposure to the space through multiple portfolio companies such as Ledger and DCG. Um, can you speak on your outlook towards the crypto market and how you're looking at it in terms of future investment? Yeah, I mean, we, we think it's going to be very volatile. We, we think that there's a great bull case where crypto becomes an important part of the financial uh, infrastructure and just an important part of transactions on the whole. Um, and there's certain, you know, no different than what we talked about in healthcare and what we talked about in AI, we talked about in software, you know, is there a use case that creates value and is there a business model that could capture a piece of that value? We think that's going to happen in crypto. We were very, very early in crypto with DCG, Ledger, a couple other investments uh, that have done very well. And, you know, we, we think that, you know, it, it will be a, it will be a wild volatile ride. Um, and therefore, we're very selective in those investments. But you know, th there is a great chance that those wind up becoming very, very large companies. Okay. Um, and then just just two last questions before we close you out. Um, bringing this uh, uh, more full circle with with the IPO market. You know, we saw a crack open with Clavio, Instacart, and Birkenstock. Um, however, the vast majority of IPOs that emerged last year are not trading above their initial offering. Um, with this in mind, do you believe that in 2024, we will see an opening in the IPO market um, that will bring a wave of positive IPOs? Uh, I hope so. Your mouth to God's ears that, that you hope that, that you're going to create a new wave uh, and that you know certain companies will be able to capture the imagination of public investors. Uh, I think I'm a little more circumspect. I think it'll open slowly for some of the best companies. Um, and things will progress. I think, you know, and then, you know, adding on top of it, 24 being an election year with what everyone knows is going to be somewhat of a volatile time that, you know, you're, you're looking at the beginning of the year of, Hey, are people able to show based on 23 annual results that they have a great business and then could they get their, uh, financials together, their S1 together to be able to go public before the markets then generally grind to a halt around that election cycle. So, you know, is there a time between April and, and September for people to get out? We, I think there'll probably be a half dozen to a dozen companies who are able to get out during that time frame. Um, not as many as we'd hope, but not many, as many as the historical norms, but much better than over the last couple of years. Well, we're just uh, we're just about out of time. And, and I can't thank you enough uh, for all of your insight and advice. Um, I want to ask you one last question. Uh, who's your favorite entrepreneur of all time? Yeah, I think I touched on, uh, it's hard to say who's your favorite. It's like, you know, I'm going to ask my favorite child. 
Uh, but I, I, I put maybe uh, I'll put a couple in there. I think Ben Silverman, which we talked about before, showed tremendous grit and thoughtfulness in building Pinterest. Uh, Brandon Beck and Mark Merrill at Riot Games um, faced tons of challenges there and built the, uh, the most successful uh, from, you know, again, napkin when we met them, the most successful game in the world in League of Legends. Um, and then, you know, I have a couple other other guys who might be less famous now, but, you know, in five years, I think will be mentioned in the same breath uh, who are building outstanding companies. Well, I can't thank you enough, uh, Rick, and um, the whole Georgetown community and all of us at Venture in the Capital. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Hoya Saxon.